Welcome to Tim's Final Confessions. I'm Tim Durling, and uh, glad to have you tuning in again. Maybe this is your first time. Maybe you just stumbled upon this. If that's the case, then you're probably an Aerosmith fan, based on the title of this. And yes, I am going to go through my Aerosmith vinyl for you. Uh, one of my earliest episodes I did for Tim's Vinyl Confessions was my Aerosmith episode. I've gotten more vinyl since then, and plus, I think that I've gotten better at doing the show and the camera angles. I know I used to sit way back and it was all trial and error. And I've had a lot of support out there, a lot of advice from a lot of you people out there, and I really appreciate that. So this time around, it's a reboot episode of my Aerosmith vinyl. Starting, of course, at the beginning with the first album, although I'm not sure exactly the issues of most of these. So here's my Canadian version of the first Aerosmith album. This is uh, one of two covers I've seen for this. They're very similar covers, but uh, later issues, this band photo is enlarged. Probably takes up a lot more of the uh, cover, and the logo is written differently. Up here, it has sort of this interesting, they hadn't gotten their logo at this point. Now, if you're a Nintendo fan, this always reminded me of the P-Wings in Super Mario 3, but that's another story. It's Columbia Records, as most of these ones are. Um... Here's the back cover, this photo of the band, and a write-up, and the song titles, and this is a Canadian issue, the CBS Records Canada. Not sure what would have originally come in this for um, liner notes, or I don't think anything came with it that was special, just as a white paper sleeve on the copy that I have, and the usual Columbia Records label for this first Aerosmith album. Most of my uh, vinyl, most of this vinyl, I think, we're going to find is Canadian. Next one, 1974, Get Your Wings, a great album, front cover. Uh, the first use of the Wings logo, a primitive version of it. Ring whirl on the top here, uh, hard to avoid that. Not impossible, but once you, if you get one like this, you can't really do anything about it, but you can prevent it. Back cover again, uh, just making sure before I say this is a Canadian issue. More lovely ring wear at the top there. Again, a white, just a white paper sleeve, although this one doesn't have a hole in it. And your usual Columbia label. Next one. Toys in the Attic, the first really big Aerosmith album, although the first two eventually went multi-platinum. First time the Aerosmith logo was written by like this, but not quite there because the wings haven't been refined yet. This is one of those uh, album covers that really makes the case for vinyl. There's a lot to discover here. The more you look at this uh, toy box setting, the more that you find. And on the back cover, that... Uh, drawing of a to uh, toy box is replaced with a real one with the band members. And this too is a Canadian issue. Uh, the way that this is written, it's a little blurry, it's a little harder to read. Kind of like, uh, you know, light orange on light brown doesn't translate well. Especially if you have an older copy. Again, just a white sleeve. And the famous Columbia label. A lot of people will swear that the next album is possibly the greatest Aerosmith album. It's the fourth one, Aerosmith Rocks, 1976. I don't know if it's my favorite, but I wouldn't doubt anyone who said it was the best, because it's really good. Really, really good. Simple album cover, but effective. Um, here's the back cover. A lot of information about the recording of it. And this is a Canadian issue, CBS Records Canada. Still no um, inner sleeves, or at least on the copies that I've got, but interestingly enough, this is a square paper sleeve, not a rounded one. And this is what the vinyl looks like for rocks. Next one, come out was 1977. 
Uh, this isn't one that you see all the time unless you're getting like new versions of them. This is Draw the Line. And I'm, I say you don't see it, you don't see it quite as often. You can find it if you're looking for Aerosmith vinyl. Great caricature of the group. First time the iconic Wings logo was used up here. Back cover, uh, very minimal. Just the song titles and this is a Canadian issue. And this is the first one, at least the first one I have, that has an inner sleeve. It's a nice quality cardboard inner sleeve. I love the, the gold logo. Nothing else. It's all you need. This would look good in a frame, actually. And on the back cover, credits. And there's what the record itself looks like. Still the same Columbia logo. Columbia label, I say it. Sometimes I use the wrong terms here. Uh, next up, another great case for um, for having vinyl. And again, not one that you see all the time. The double live albums, if they weren't huge double live albums like Kiss Alive, um, then you don't maybe see them all that much. I find that you could see patterns in the albums that people bought a lot of. And double live albums were more expensive, so you might have to search a little longer to fill in the collection. But this is Live Bootleg from 1978. Um, and right away looking at this, it's obvious that it's Canadian because it's got French and English down here at the bottom. They're not very thick. Two albums, two records set, and it's Canadian again. Uh, the coffee stains on there, if you've never seen the back cover, that's intentional. It's supposed to look like a bootleg. Uh, to the point where not even all the songs are listed on here. Towards the end, they do draw the line. It's not even listed on here. And so it's a it's kind of sloppy on purpose. Lots of cool pictures to look inside of this. This is the first gatefold. Tons of cool pictures of the band to look at. Uh, before I get into the inner sleeves, when I bought this... Um, it, it had what looks to be part of somebody's uh, a report, a school report. And this person was obviously Canadian. They did a report on Duncan Campbell Scott. Now, I'm not a historian, so I probably should know that name. Man, does that look like that could have been typed on my old typewriter that my parents had. Now, on the back, they wrote out the lyrics to Chip Away the Stone. Fantastic Aerosmith song, and one that made its first appearance on live bootleg in its uh, in a live form. The studio version's another story, but they actually they, they made a point to try and write the lyrics. Not all of them are right either. So I don't know who this was that had this, but it's kind of cool that you, every once in a while you'll find something like that that has, has nothing at all to do with the album. It's just cool. So, um, I'm going to dig into this. It's for a two-record set. This came with... Um, a big poster of the group. And I'll try to show this to you now. It's just a four square poster, I guess you could call this, of the group. It was cool when they would put extra stuff in like that. So here's the sleeve. Uh, this is for sides one and two, so this is for the first record. Same Columbia logo, or Columbia label still, still using the same one. They haven't gotten any, oddly enough, they haven't gotten any customized ones yet. And here we are with record two. You can notice cool little things like this middle picture of Joe Perry. There are old Sprite cans there, I'm sure that was just mix. <laughs> and uh, more credits with the songs on sides three and four. And the same logo used for live bootleg. Same label. Now this is where I, I veer off from the beaten path because uh, the record I'm about to show you was not one of Aerosmith's more popular ones but I definitely rated 10 out of 10. I love it. Night in the Ruts. 1979. This album came out at a very tumultuous time for the band. Joe Perry had one foot out the door. In fact his replacement Jimmy Crespo plays on at least one of the songs here. But they still managed to cobble together a really good album. I think their best, one of their best produced albums of the 70s. Rock sounded pretty good. This sounds pretty good too. I don't know. I don't know why I have such an affinity for this one. It's another 
Canadian edition. Uh, this one's not a gatefold. Pictures of the group, uh, you know, dressed as miners. Um, and an order form for some Aerosmith merchandise, which includes songbooks, shirts, patches, hats, posters, and at the down the bottom here, um, all of the albums they'd released to this point. So you can see they've done a little bit something a little bit different with the first album there. And the same label still. Coming up is I think to this day. I think the single biggest selling Aerosmith album. This one is a diamond certified album, and I don't think any of their other albums can claim that distinction. It's their first greatest hits from 1980. Still an excellent introduction to this or the early work of Aerosmith. Aerosmith's greatest hits written around the top. A little tiny bit of ring wear. Should have been a gatefold. Should have been a gatefold. So you can show the logo off. Um, this is actually a, an American issue. It's not a Canadian one this time around. So I've actually had two versions of this, which is, uh, I'll show you that there are slight differences. Uh, I had a, a Canadian issue that was really beat up, really beat up, really scratched, um, as you can see by looking at it. It's got the same Columbia label on it. That's the side one's really, there. It's a little bit better on side two, at least to show you what it looks like. So if you study that, the way that it looks, I'll show you the slight difference between that and the American one, or at least the pressings that I have. This came in a, a clear white, or not clear, but a brighter white sleeve, and slightly different printing, but the same basic label for greatest hits. 1982, an album which gets a bad rep. I actually think it's quite good. And again, not one that you see all the time, Rock in a Hard Place. So this came out in 82. Back cover. This is, um, I think this is a U.S. version. Um, for the first time, there's some lyrics. It's only to the song Prelude to Joni, so it's not even a full song, really. On the back, we have uh, all of their albums up to that point, except for the Greatest Hits one, and uh, some credits. And the usual Columbia label. Um, next up, 1985. Aerosmith switched labels to Geffen Records and put out another underrated album. Doesn't get a good reputation. Done with mirrors. And uh, now the funny thing is when I hold this up to my camera, um, it's the right way. <laughs> but of course... Almost everything on this was printed backwards on purpose because it's done with mirrors. Uh, if you look in the background, there's a guy like bending a fork with his mind, whatever that means. And uh, everything was printed on this backwards except for the, um, hold on, except for serial number. Probably legally they couldn't. And this is a Canadian issue on Geffen. It's also upside down. So everything on this is upside down. So the record comes up the bottom on this. A photo of the band and a better picture of what you're seeing behind the name. Oddly enough, another odd thing about it is it looks it looks kind of funny. They don't use their logo. And so we have the record itself. Everything backwards on it except for the serial number and the Geffen logo. So, as happens, it happens a lot actually. It happened, I don't think it ever doesn't happen when a group changes record labels. They go to another label, and if they even gain just a slight glimmer of success, the previous label starts churning out old product. And uh, it's happened to Aerosmith twice because they've flip flopped labels a lot. So they went from Columbia to Geffen. Now Columbia in 1986 puts this out, Classics Live. 
There's various tracks recorded between 1977 and 1983, so there are varying lineups on here. The Classics Live albums, you don't see all that much. They probably could have put... The, there's two in this series. They, they, they eventually put them on one CD. They probably could have put them on one record, although I'm not sure. And what I've got here is a Canadian version of Classics Live, the first one. Aerosmith discography, of course, done with mirrors, not on here. Various pictures of the group. So, um, he has pictures of Jimmy Crespo and Rick Dufay on here as well, not just the classic Aerosmith lineup. And we are back to the familiar Columbia label. So the next year, he puts uh, another volume out. Classics Live 2, same format, different color. I think I like the red, but the red looks better. This is another Canadian issue of this. Uh, a lot of these songs are more recent because a lot of them came from their 1984 reunion tour that they did. And this album is also interesting because on that reunion tour, they had converted a Joe Perry Project song, Let the Music Do the Talking, to an Aerosmith song, and put it on Done With Mirrors. And here it is, even though it appeared in the Geffen album, here it is on an Aerosmith album, the second to last track. Penultimate, I guess, the fancy word for it. And uh, this time, we have a clear sleeve that the record is housed in. So, Columbia label. And one a single page of various pictures of the group. And credits for Classics Live 2. Now, the big... Aerosmith Comeback album, of course, also 1987, Permanent Vacation. This was their comeback, and it was a huge comeback, and it's the reason people know who Aerosmith are now, for you know a lot of the younger generation, myself included, at least around this time period. Uh, this is a Canadian issue on Geffen Records. It's sealed, and I'm not opening it. This was bought at Sam the Record Man when they were starting to get rid of their vinyl. And, um, yeah, very familiar. Like anybody knows anything about Aerosmith, you'd have this album, so... I'm sure there's nothing different in here that's not in the uh, cassette or CD. So once again, and that was even bigger, so now Columbia Records comes back. But this time around, I, I think it's just a strength of the material. I don't think it was any great record company initiative. Uh, in late 1988, this came out. This is Aerosmith Gems. And this is a perfect companion to the original 1980 Greatest Hits album. This collects the songs that didn't make that, that you know could conceivably have. So this covers their career from their first album all the way through Rock and a Hard Place with the added bonus of putting the studio version of Chip Away the Stone uh, on here, which had previously, it's ne it had never been on an Aerosmith album before. And such a great song too. And this is a Canadian issue, very minimal, the credits. But this collects songs like Train Kept a Rollin', Mama Kin, um, you know, the songs that, that didn't make the Greatest Hits album but were still... You know, well-known songs that they would have done in concert. And inside of this, again, the discography, not including the two Geffen albums, of course. And on the back, an order form for their Live at Texas Jam 78 video cassette, which I used to have. I didn't keep most of my video cassettes. Um, great song list on here. Terrible performance. And the band would tell you that it was their the height of their heavy drug period, unfortunately. Same Columbia label. One more time, a little bit more fancy with the printing on gems. Next up, I think one of Aerosmith's finest albums um, came out at the right time, too. It was a golden period, I think, in rock music, my opinion, because I would have been 15, so take that for what it's worth. But a good album and a very successful album, too. Pump. This is uh, not a reissue. This, I'm happy to say, is a, is a U.S. Geffen issue. From 1989. This was a huge album for them. Permanent Vacation set the stage for the comeback and, and, and got them in the door. Well, no, I shouldn't say that. That's kind of what Done With Mirrors did and the Run DMC remake of Walk This Way. Permanent Vacation, no doubt, that was a breakthrough album for them and Pump solidified it and I think took it a little bit further. Just a great album from start to finish. Very, very experimental album, even though it was it's still very commercial. Pump. Band photos, and uh, down the side, credits. And the usual Geffen label. 
logo and label. Vinyl's in really good shape. I'm sure Permanent Vacation looked like that too. Uh, so an album that was, for me, um, by... Not that I bought records that much back then, but I'm going to say by 1990... Yeah, I think I'm right. By 1990, you weren't seeing vinyl albums in the stores that much at all. They just slowly... And because I wasn't buying them, I didn't notice. I was buying cassettes, 90 through 91. I switched over to CDs. So I didn't really notice the time. You know, the last time a, a band that I liked put out an album and the vinyl was available to buy. It uh, turned into more of a European, UK thing where you could still get it. And so in 1993, I actually bought a new vinyl um, within yeah, maybe six months of it being released, which, you know, was still new. Get a Grip was the next Aerosmith Studio album. And the version I have here is, uh, it says it was printed in Holland. So it's on Geffen, distributed by uh, BMG in Europe as opposed to MCA. And uh, this is on two records. It's got two songs on it that were not on the North American cassette or CD. Can't Stop Messing. And uh, let me see now. I guess it was Can't Stop Messing was the only one, which was a B-side. It was a B-side of Living on the Edge, which was the first single from this album. That CD and cassette single contained Can't Stop Messing and also contained another song called Don't Stop. Uh, Can't Stop Messing is the extra song on here. Now this is not a gatefold, but it does have two vinyl in it. They had some very unique um, artwork choices going on here. And a lot of these ended up on singles, whether it was domestic or foreign. For instance, this pinhead art here in color was the Living on the Edge uh, single cover. Your credits, still the same um, Geffen label. And if you notice the reflection there, these some of these have just three songs on the side, very wide bands on here. Probably, maybe not. Maybe they couldn't have put it on one record. I don't know. Picture of the band there. And all the lyrics. Record looks exactly the same as far as the label and the logo go. So, Nine Lives came out in 1997. I don't know. I don't think that came out in vinyl, but I could be wrong. Unless it's been reissued. I don't think it came out of vinyl at the time. 2001, Just Push Play. I think that may have come out on vinyl. I don't have it. Uh, Honkin' on Bobo came out in 2004. And I know that came out on vinyl because I've seen it, but I don't have it. So the next, the next, and still to this day, the last Aerosmith Studio album. I happened to come across this used. Therefore, it was open because I don't open my sealed vinyl. But 2012, and I really like this cover, Music from Another Dimension. This album was a long time coming. It has some good songs on it. It was released in a lot of con configurations. Uh, this is a standard one. In other words, it has 15 songs on it. Some have as many as 19. There were a lot of extra songs depending on where you got it. This is a U.S. version. Here's the back cover. And this is a gatefold. This gatefold that came out in poster form inside the CD. And the artwork is by Slash, actually. So this act has the, the records in it. This is just a flimsy piece of cardboard. I don't know why they didn't put the, the two records in each, but they didn't. So I'll show you what they look like. I guess that's the first one. So... The lyrics, blurry picture of the group. I think if you had 3D glasses, you could see it. That's what, what I'm getting out of it. And that, and a pleasant surprise. I don't have a lot of this, or at least not that's open. Colored vinyl. I love it. It's so cool. Now, I thought for a second if I looked at that band photo through this, it would be clear, but I guess, no, it isn't. <laughs> I'm looking for something that isn't there. Alright, so, here's the second record. And again, red vinyl. So that's my Aerosmith vinyl collection. I have a couple more things to show you. Um, 
Joe Perry, of course, left Aerosmith in 1979 and formed his own group, the Joe Perry Project. They released three albums, and I've got two of them on vinyl to show you. First one came out in 1980, Let the Music Do the Talking. That's a very familiar song title if you're a big Aerosmith fan, and it is the same song, although Steven Tyler rewrote the lyrics. It's essentially the same song. The music's the same. The chorus is the same. You don't see this one all that much. This is a Canadian issue on Columbia Records, so he retained the same label the band had. I don't know if it had lyrics with it originally. The copy I have does not. And just in a white paper sleeve and usual Columbia label. And the second Joe Perry Project album, 1981, called I've Got the Rock and Rolls Again. This too is a Canadian issue. For some reason, I think even though Let the Music Do the Talking was the most successful of the three, I've seen this one more. In other words, I've seen it after I've already gotten it and just noticed, oh, that's interesting. And, uh, no, um, no lyric sheet, at least none of the one I have, just a white paper sleeve with a hole in it, and your usual Columbia label. So that's a look at my Aerosmith vinyl. Thanks for watching this edition of Tim's Final Confessions.